Hello again and welcome to Celestial Revival. I am Celestial and you are welcome to my channel. Hello to all new and old subscribers. You're very welcome. And let's get into today's word. Please check the three dots menu at the top or look along the bottom row until you see a little wheel thing. Click that or click up there and find the word quality and then upgrade the quality of the video to 720p or 1080p. I just want to apologize if the videos are a little blurry or grainy. Actually, when I shoot them, I shoot them in the highest available uh, quality on my phone, which is 1080, which is absolutely so clear. But then um, YouTube keeps downgrading the quality of videos now due to, I don't know, pandemic streaming or whatever. So they make the videos for 480. And unless you manually upgrade it down here on your computer or your tablet or up there on your cell phone, it tends to be all fuzzy. And I don't want you to have a bad time on this channel. So please that just do that for me. And without further ado, let's get started. So I'm back on track. I'm talking about transition, but because God is so good, I found a way to still tuck a few more tidbits about fear in today's word. Today, it's called receiving instructions, transition, receiving instructions. So I've already covered what transition is. Transition is any type of movement, travel, or journey, or shift, change that you are going through from one set of circumstances, from one reality to the other. It may be a physical transition where God is moving you across the country, or he may be moving you to a different state. It may be a shorter type of transition where you have to change jobs or you have to change location for whatever reason. It may be a different type of transition where you're growing. Maybe you're a teenager now and you're starting to get into an older teenager or a young adult. It may be an emotional transition where you've gone through something good in the past and now you're starting to enter a difficult season of testing in your life. Or maybe where you've gone through something bad in the past and now God is bringing you into a place of restoration, of healing and recovery, and just where your soul can take a break and where you can recover yourself. Whatever the transition is, it might even be a spiritual transition where God is saying, you've been living on milk long enough. You've been a baby Christian long enough. It's time for you to begin to challenge yourself. It's time for you to begin to challenge even your ideas about me. You've only known me perhaps as Santa Jesus. Santa Jesus is just Celestial's way of describing this picture that modern Christianity gives so many of us of God, like a constant reckless love nanny. He's there with the apron and the bottle. All you have to do is cry and he's going to meet that need. If you are a Christian who is lucky, or unlucky enough to be born now which is the advent of the end times and it will get more serious and more graphic as we go you must understand that baby christianity even bread christianity baby christianity is called milk christianity and slightly mature christianity is called bread christianity these things will not serve you well in the end times if you do not develop a strong and a bulk faith that is known as strong meat Christianity, you will be very, very shocked, my friend, to find that you are ill-equipped, ill-prepared to handle the rigors, which means the very, very hard and stiff difficulties and requirements of the end times. In fact, if you read your Bible at all, you will know and understand. Don't mean to bring a heavy topic here, but I have to be an honest person if these videos are going to help anyone. In the end times, there's going to be a lot of death. I think I'm going to make a video like that, but not right now, not until the Lord leads me. But there are some sobering things that are waiting for us up ahead, brothers and sisters. And it's deeply in the heart of God. It's deeply in the mind of God. It's on his mind a lot that his people need to be prepared for the times ahead. It's very difficult to lead a people that have a different expectation from their leader. The life of Moses that I've covered in past videos depict that. That's because the, the leader is thinking one thing, but the people have a different expectation. And what happens is when there's expectations that are like this, instead of being lined up like this, there's a pulling and there's a tearing and things don't work. And when things don't work, conflict comes into play and usually either the leader or the people suffer. 
So God's mind and God's heart for us in these modern times is not for us to be stuck on lollipop Christianity, which is to tell you the truth, a lot of sensationalism, a lot of emotionalism, a lot of, oh my goodness, these 12 people that I love are getting together and having a conference and it's just going to be so anointed. And you drive halfway across the country with three of your best friends and you guys get into the presence of God, which is great. And you sing and you cry and everybody just mingles the tears together and it's awesome. And then you come home and you realize that there is no in-depth planting. There's no step-by-step -step, step instructional building core and structure inside you to actually get you through your day-to-day -day life. A lot of Christians, if we're honest, we're living our lives in Christ experientially. What does that mean? We just want to have encounters with God. I don't understand this new craze. Jesus Christ is with you every day. He has sworn by himself and he cannot turn it back. I will not leave you, nor will I forsake you. That means that just like you wake up and your eyebrows are there and your nose is there, your two hands are there. If you only have one hand, God bless you. Your hand is there. But just as your parts are with you every day, so faithful is the spirit of God. So faithful is the Lord Yah himself to never leave, to never forsake. But it is up to us to develop the kind of faith that is no longer experiential, meaning I constantly need to experience God or I'm having a crisis, God, are you there? None of us wonders if our eyes are there or if our teeth are there. We know they're there. But how is it that we are not growing to the place where we know that no matter what, God will not abandon, God will not fail, God will not forsake, God shall not cast off, God shall not shrug us off, God will not put us off, but he will listen to our prayer requests and he will answer in good timing and in such a way that even what we did not ask or think shall be made available to us. We have to grow out of this constant need for, I didn't experience the Holy Ghost. I spent an hour praying, but I didn't get a word. This is why so many of us are crippled. Gideon was crippled in a certain way. We've been covering Gideon and we've been looking at fear. But in the story of Gideon, when the Lord came to Gideon and made himself known, Gideon kept putting God through a series of tests. And yet Jesus in the wilderness says to Satan as one of the things that is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Meaning don't push God and don't put God to the test. Nevertheless, because God understands that he has milk, meat, and bread Christians, he is not averse to being asked by someone who is nervous or scared, God, please give me a word. God, please give me a sign. God, please give me a, a, some, some scripture. Please lead me somewhere in the Bible so that I can understand or just feel a little bit more confident about what it is that you're saying to me or what it is that you want me to do. Gideon kept testing God. Okay, I'm going to put the sheepskin out. Let the ground be wet and the sheepskin be dry. Okay, if it's really you, please ex receive this offering from my hand. And the Lord receives it and puts fire on it to let him know. See, I put a little something on it. Now you know that it's me because who's going to set your meat and bread on fire? That's how he knew he had seen the angel of the Lord. Okay, Lord, please let the ground be dry. And now this time, let the sheepskin be wet. And God was very patient with Gideon. But this is an example of where many people are today, where their faith is so low and they still are living at an experiential level. They still want to have an encounter with God every day. Brothers and sisters, let me use, even if you're not married, I'm going to use um, the example of a married couple. Do you know how exhausted your spouse would be if you constantly were saying that every time you came home, there had to be candies, flowers, balloons, cake, and somebody jumping out of a cake going, you're my wife, my wife that I love. Who is going to be able to sustain that level of clownery? 
There is no man who has a daytime job and has people trying to backstab him at the office. No woman who has a kid or no kids and has responsibilities in the modern world who is going to be able to come home and perform for you at this new Jack Swing love and basketball level. This is why so many relationships come under pressure. Why? unrealistic expectations of one another. If you have an experiential faith, a faith that constantly, constantly needs encounters to feel validated, you're not ready for the end times. You're not ready for the new world order. You're not ready for the beast. You're not even ready for when the local Walmart in your town closes down and you can't get food. It is time for us to grow. It is time for us to mature it is time for us to transition. And to transition, you need to receive instructions. Unless you're just going to end up in a hole like Bugs Bunny and Wiley e. Coyote. So I'm going to read first from Joshua chapter 3 and just a few verses. It says, Then Joshua rose up early in the morning, and they set out from Acacia Grove, and they came to the Jordan River. And he and all the children of Israel lodged there for the night before they crossed over. So it was that after three days, the officers went throughout the camp and they commanded the people saying, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, your God and the priests and the Levites carrying it, then you shall set out from your places and go after it. Yet let there be a space between you and the Ark, about 2000 cubits in length, do not come near it so that you can know the way that you must go for you have not traveled this way before. That's verse four. Very important for you have not traveled this way before. Brothers and sisters, there's some transitions that are more or less the same painful, repetitive circumstances going around and round in a cycle in life. Whether this is an evil process or an evil pattern repeating itself in your life over and over, or whether this is a training drill that has been instituted in your life by God to mature your faith, to grow you, and to get a lot of the childish uh, fur off you so that you can grow into a stronger bear of a Christian. Understand that sometimes transi transitions can seem very repetitive and the danger of transitions seeming repetitive is that people enter into these cycles thinking, I've been through this before. I know this. I've, I've seen this. I've done this. And so I know what to do. And so they jump into these transitions and they're like, don't worry, God, I got this. I got this. The last time it was like this, I was going through financial difficulties. I connected with a person online. We prayed together. And that same night I had a 24 hour miracle. It was the 24 hour miracle. Um, so-and-so prayer. I prayed that I bookmarked it to my YouTube. I'm going back to pray that. And you go back and you pray and, and you, you get no miracle. Nothing happens. 24, 48, you're counting down time like Denzel Washington in a movie and nothing's happening. Why? Because God has brought the same cycle back to build your trust, but this time he has no intention of the enemy that you're fighting being something that you can knock out with a 24 hour punch. This time you're going to be on what is known as the three to six month broke and buying stuff from the dollar store miracle cycle. And in that time, God is expecting you to learn not to cry, not to complain, to realize that loft and other clothing stores do not need all your money that you need to learn the adult habit of budgeting. You need to learn the other adult habit called saving, not very popular with humanity at the moment. You need to learn how to do away with luxuries and pare your life down. The word pair means to cut with a sharp knife so that fat falls away. You need to pare your life down to the basics. And then when you've been cut down to the basics, you still need to praise God and say, thank you that I am not walking in the desert eating sand. That's how you get out of milk Christianity. That's how you get out of always needing an encounter. You have to learn how to apply faith to daily life, whether you're still in one place or whether God is transitioning you 
so that you can grow, mature, and begin to look more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. So sometimes we'll get into these transitions. We think, I've seen this before, this looks familiar, and we start to apply what we did in the past. And then it turns out that's not what God wants you to do at all. That's not the way God is going to solve the problem. Just because he took care of your housing and your mortgage problem by having your cousin go, hey, I got my tax rebate back and God spoke to me and told me to give it to you. And then you you take that money and you think, whew, this was just on time. You pay, but then the real problem is that you're sloppy in your finances and so you soon fall into debt again. So God is not going to have your other cousin or your aunt or your various family members. Each one is going to be touched by an angel for June, July, and August so that they they give you their tax ref- your, their tax refund so that you don't have to grow and mature and learn how to budget so that you can pay your necessities and stop buying Xbox fives and things like that. God never solves a problem the same way twice. And a person who paid a very painful price for that, for not realizing that, was, was um, the, the prophet, the amazing man that I love and respect, Moses. When they needed water the first time, God said, hit the rock. And he hit it and the water came back. But when they needed water the second time, God said, speak to the rock. But those people provoked Moses to the point where his hair was standing on end. And he was so frustrated that he did not listen and do exactly what God said. He did not follow the exact instructions. And so he hit the rock again. And for that apparently simple little mistake, God took away Moses' right to enter the promised land. And Moses died outside of the land of Canaan at the top of Mount Nebo. Can you imagine getting so, getting so close to the finish line? And then God goes, I'm going to bench you right here, Tucker. Can't go any further. But the evil, frustrating, wretched people, they got to go further. And Moses could only watch from the top of the mountain, looking at the promise that he had worked all his life to receive. But God's ways are sovereign and he knows best. So today I'm here to tell you that as you are transitioning, you may be in a transition right now. You may be coming out of one just near the finish line. You can feel it. The horrible season is almost over and you can just feel that God is about to do something great in your life. Or you may feel those horrible feelings like my life is not going so well. The grease of my life is starting to erase. My life is feeling kind of sticky. Things are not going well for me. I sense that I'm about to enter a bad season. Transition may be about to start. You may be in one or you may be coming out of one. It is still important. No matter what stage of a transition you are, you need instructions. Why? Because as God told Joshua and as Joshua said to the people, keep a space between you and the ark. You have not passed this way before. What does that mean? It means you don't know where you're going. You don't know what it's going to end up like. You still don't know what the final result will be. You are supposed to be living by faith and not by sight. It doesn't matter if he already said that he's in love with you, he's crazy about you, and that when he sleeps, instead of dreaming about food, he's now dreaming about you. It doesn't matter if he's already bought the ring. It doesn't even matter if it's on your finger. Promises need to be fulfilled. You need to actually get to the altar. You need to make sure that not Cupid, but Satan does not come up into that relationship with a bow and arrow the size of what that girl had in the Hunger Games and just loose 22 arrows into that relationship. And then with six weeks to go to the wedding, you guys are fighting because not because you are not ordained to marry each other, not because you're not a perfect soul match, but just because of D-I-T-M. Demons in the mix. They jump right in. They stir it up. And before you know it, the two of you have torn apart. Somebody's thrown the ring into a sewer and the other guy is mad. And then you're not getting married anymore. And Satan is chalk up one billion for me, humanity zero. We don't need that kind of energy in our faith walk. When you are transitioning, you need all the instructions, not some of them. You need all the instructions and you need to follow them 
methodically until the end. That means instruction A comes before instruction B and then C and D. You don't follow your own opinion or you don't follow God. This doesn't look right. How can I, how can I so, uh, uh, I need a thousand dollars to pay my rent and I've got 400. No, you're asking me to give 250 to my sister who only needs 250 to pay her rent. If I give her 250, I've gone from having four to whatever the math is, 150. I still got it. I still got it. I still got it. I don't have enough. I already don't have enough. And now you're trying to make my not enough even less. And God is saying, do it because God knows all the fifties and he knows exactly what he has to give you. But the point is that obedience is required in transition or you will end up like Moses. Sorry, Moses. You will end up like Samson who could not obey to save his life. And Saul who had the most severe listen and understanding problem of all time. If ever a person could not listen, it had to be King Saul. Major hearing problem, major obedience problem, and therefore lost his kingdom. And not only that, lost his life because he was so wicked. So let's go to Gideon's story. And I'm just going to read lightly from Judges chapter 7. And we've already talked about how Gideon is a person who has what I call an experiential faith, constantly needs to experience God in order to feel strong enough to do. He needed to experience God to tear down the altar. He needed to experience God accepting his sacrifice before he would even believe that he was a mighty man. And here again, Gideon needs to experience God before he will obey the instructions. But thanks to, thanks, you know what? Um, not thanks to, thanks to God and thanks to grace and credit to Gideon. He did obey and he did do what God, what God said. So it said that um, Gideon and all the people who were with him woke up early and they went to camp by the well of Herod. And the camp of the Midians, Midianites, this is the enemy, the people who constantly caused them to fear, was on the other side of the hill of Morah. And there was a valley between them. And God told Gideon, these men that you have called for the battle are too many for me. And if I allow you to capture the Midianites and beat them, then Israel is going to claim that her strength of numbers brought her glory. And you're going to say, my own hand has saved me. So now go to the proclaim, go proclaim to the people and tell them, if anybody out here is afraid and too scared, let that person turn right now and go home. Gideon obeyed. So this was the first instruction. God is telling Gideon, I already told you that you're going to be the champion of Israel. I already told you that salvation for Israel is going to come not only out of your house, your, your clan, which you said is the least clan, and your father's house, which you said is the least family in your clan, but salvation is going to come through your hand, who's the youngest and the least in the family. You've already built me an altar. You controlled your fear. You overcame and moved in your godly identity and you put me, God, back on top as Lord. So now let's get to the real part of transition. Let's transition this entire nation out of servitude to these unwashed heathens and let's get Israel back on top. I, God, am now back on top as God. You've called the people of God to fight and they have come. But you guys are too many and I don't want you to claim at the testimony time, oh, because I had 40,000 soldiers, I showed those guys. No, I want to be exalted in this transition. Listen to me and obey the instructions. Why? Because you have not passed this way before. You've never been a deliverer. Some of you are a first generation Christian in your family. There's never been a Christian in your family until you. So all the family witchcraft altars, the demons, the generational curses, the witch next door, they all shoot spiritual warfare and attacks at you all the time. Some of you are the first to go to college. Some of you are the first to get married before you had a baby. Some of you are the first to clean themselves up without getting married and having the babies and declare, I will not let a man touch or defile my body again until I stand before the altar and marry. And whatever it is you're the first to do, Satan will always come to try and test that thing to see if you really mean it. 
to see if you are truly transitioning from being a baby who always messes up themselves. Oops, God, I made another sin. Oops, God, sorry. Until you grow into a mature person that said, look at that God. Made a whole meal, didn't drop a single grain of rice on myself. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace. Satan will always come to test the first. And this is why God is saying to Gideon, you have never done this deliverance thing before. I've raised you up to be a deliverer, but let's be frank. You tested me three times before we even got started. You don't know the way that you're going. None of us know the way that transition is bringing us. Brothers and sisters, even if you are prophetic or even if you just have a good instinct and you can see, kind of guess where God is taking you, it doesn't mean you know and you will mess it up if you try to go ahead of the ark. The ark represents the spirit. The spirit goes first and then you keep a space between you and God. Why did Joshua tell them to leave a space between the priests carrying the ark and them? Because if you ride up on God's back like this, God is going to be like, can I have some time to work? You only started having this problem two weeks ago and you've already asked me 17 times to fix it and I would like to, but I am not a genie or a butler. I am God. I need time to work and you also need time to build faith and trust me that I will work. Some people have been trusting God for years. I am one of those people. I have been trusting God for some things for over a decade and a half. That's right. I don't look like how old I am. I have been trusting God for some things for 10 years, some things for 15 years, and some things I've been trusting him for since I got born again, which is 19 years so far. And he still hasn't done it. And I'm still here. I'm still with him. The ark is still moving and I'm still following it because there's no other ark, no other spirit that I want to be affiliated with or follow. So God said, leave the space and let the ark go first because you know when your GPS is directing you, just imagine if she goes turn and you just turn and she would go right. And then you're like, oh God, I already turned left. You have to wait for her to say, turn right. And then you turn right and then she goes, continue 500 yards. And then you continue 500 yards. And what are you doing? You're not just driving at the speed of light. When she tells you 500 yards, you know that's a short distance. And so you're waiting to see if she's going to tell you, press, eject, and jump out before the truck hits you. Or you're waiting to see if she says, turn right again, right again, or left. You're waiting for her to speak. And then when she speaks, you follow with the right motion. It's the same with the spirit. Let God speak, and then you Receive the instruction and obey, and then you will make your transition safely and with the least amount of loss. I talked about loss and transition. If you haven't watched that video, you absolutely need to watch it. It's called the sting in the tail. Satan will rate, wait until you get to the finish line and then just loose those arrows and you can end up losing your blessing. Moses, sorry, Moses. You can end up losing your blessing. You can end up disappointed after putting 99.999% of the work in. You can still end up defeated by Satan. Because when Satan comes to play, he don't come to play games. If you don't know that yet in Christianity, you're still brand new. You will learn. Satan comes to play. He has no mercy. This is why the Bible says, do you not know that there is a roaring lion out there seeking whose soul to consume? To devour. This doesn't tell you that this is a personality that if you're fighting him and you make a wrong move, he's going to go like, oh, she probably didn't mean to do that. He will knock you out and God will just lift you, put some ice there and tell you, get back in the ring. You need to receive instructions and you need to wait until you receive instructions because if you go ahead of God before you receive instructions, you will just end up like King Saul who always did things before the prophet told him and then lied about it afterwards. And that's why he died. So God said, tell the people who are scared to go home. So that was the first instruction. That was the second instruction. The first one was that he should build an altar. And even though he was scared, he did it. 
Now, the second instruction was, you've gathered all these people. There are too many. I don't want them to take glory. Send the scared ones home. Scared people are no good in battle. Please keep away from people in your life who do not believe in your dreams. I'm not saying go to them and act like a child and say, I'm not calling you anymore because you don't believe in my dreams. That's just juvenile. Please be a mature person who knows how to finesse their way in life. What I'm saying is do not reveal the deepest dreams and desires of your heart to people who do not have the faith to carry it with you. Doesn't matter if it's your mother. If your mother doesn't believe in you, stop telling her your business. Scared people are no good in a transition. You need to get rid of them. This is why Jesus put out all the mockers and scoffers when that little girl was dead. He only left her parents because he knew that her parents wanted her alive at all costs and they would pray with all their heart that their child came back. Everyone else who said, she's dead, what can you do? He put them out and sure enough, the girl came back. Never try to do works of faith in front of people who are afraid and faithless. That's just for free. So God said, send the scared people home and 22,000 people went and 10,000 people remained. And God said, no, this is still too many people. Take them down to the river and I'm going to separate them from you. And God sets a simple test. He says, if anyone bends down and drinks the water like a dog, set that part, set that person apart for him from by himself. And if anyone gets down on his knees to drink, set that person apart by their, themselves. So three, only 300 people lapped water. So they took the water and they put it up to their mouth to drink like a dog. But all the rest of the people knelt down to drink water. Now there's a lot of people who, who just think this is an arbitrary test. What does it mean anyway? It's probably just an Old Testament thing. No, it's just a little bit of common sense by God. When you're a fighting man and you enter enemy territory, right? You enter enemy territory where the enemies are, people are hiding behind bushes and trees and waiting to drop down on you. And you come to a place of water and you kneel down. You are just basically saying, please stab me in my jugular and then kick me like that King Legolas and 300, kick me into the water and let my dead body float there for the fish. A man who is alert and a man who is useful in the point of battle, a woman who is alert and useful in battle would never kneel down and have all their senses focused on the water. The people who went to the water and bent and took the water, drinking it, were able to always watch their surroundings. That's who you want to transition with. That's who you want to build with. That's who you want to marry because the end times are coming. So... Only 300 people did that. Everybody else was a person who does not, did not display usefulness in battle. And so God sent them home and said, with only these 300 men, I'm going to save you against this whole huge tribe. And then after that came a new set of instructions. Gideon's waiting to say, but God, you know, we don't have swords and we don't have shields. Remember I said in the previous video that Israel was prevented by them, their enemies from having any metal weapons or anything that they could use. So they just had very, very um, basic weapons, probably blocks of wood or clubs or things like that. And here's how God saved them. God saved them with glass bottles or pottery and lamps and horns. So all God did was... He gave them trumpets and he gave them pottery and they went and surrounded their enemies with basically cups and musical instruments. And this should let you know that sometimes God will save you in a way that is so miraculous, so strange to your understanding. And that itself is a test. If you will listen to the Lord and heed the instructions, no matter how strange and unbelievable they sound, if you will give the 250 to your sister because she's got all her rent and just that little bit is left, if you will take your little bit, which isn't even next to the rent you need, and give it to your sister, God will give you all your rent plus more. But first, your obedience is necessary. It is not enough to hear the instruction. It is not enough to receive instructions in transition. They are no good to you if you do not obey them. So Gideon went and they surrounded the enemy 
and they blew the trumpet and some of the men screamed out the sword of the Lord and the sword of Gideon. And then they smashed the pitchers. And what happened was a completely spiritual takeover. God just sent a spirit of confusion into the camp. And the Midianites actually thought that a huge army had come against them. And they started stabbing each other for free down there in the valley. They became confused. They were discombobulated. It was the middle of the night. Who wants to be woken up with smashing sounds and trumpets? In the old days, the sound of the trumpet meant that the army was on your back. And so when they heard that, they just freaked out and they started fighting. Everyone started fighting, thinking that the man next to him was an Israelite who had come to kill him. And in that way, a lot of them killed each other. And then the, the remainder fled. And the Bible says that Gideon blew the trumpet again and the rest of Israel pursued them and put many of them to death. And this epic battle was actually how they overthrew the rule of their enemies and came out from under the oppression that they had been living under ever since Gideon was born. Gideon was born in captivity, but because he was able to overcome his fear, because he was able to reclaim his godly identity, because he was able to restore proper worship and put God back in his place, God used Gideon to transition the nation out of slavery and oppression back to being one of the top fighting nations of the day. And so that's just what I wanted to share with you today. Transition, receiving instruction, it's extremely important. Not doing it is going to cost you. I am Celestial and this is Celestial Revival. Thanks for being with me today. God bless you. Please share the video with someone. I hope these teachings are helping you in your daily life. Just take the time when you're less busy and watch them so that the word of God shared genuinely and transparently from my heart to yours can change you. God bless you. Thanks for being with me. And until I see you again, bye.